Hi, and welcome to the XRTK podcast, where we're going to talk about all things XR and also things, more importantly, the mixed reality toolkits. I am Sam Jackson. I'm one of the core, I'm the principal architect for the XRTK. I uh, worked with this since the beginning and also the MRTK. And my co host is. I am Dino. I'm uh, basically, uh, I started contributing to the XRTK a while ago and yeah, create some projects with it. And here is Simon to talk about the mixed reality toolkit. <laughs> hey, we're in this together, pal. This is a two man, the two man team, along with the vast, vast array of other developers we've got helping, supporting, and also vendors. I mean, it's it's a great yeah. community we're slowly building. Yeah. And let's not get you know the work you've done of late, especially with the hands logic. I mean, that's just hands down. <laughs> it is the best joke ever. It is hands down. Dino's the best. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So. Uh, Basically, the podcast, as we're kicking off, uh, as we're approaching some of our big major releases and there's some great work coming up now, and the amount of partners and contributors and things going up, we thought it wise to actually get out there and start talking. So I'm here really to just talk about the XRTK, how we built things, how it's made up, and also look at some of the things we do in the community. Why are you here, Dino? Apart from me forcing you to start talking about the XRTK. <laughs> I guess I'm just here to learn and um, understand the XRK better once you start explaining its architecture and um, to talk about, of course, um, my work, my hands stuff I'm working on and everything else. And in general, always happy to talk about mixed reality, I guess, as everyone in the community is. Let's, let's try one little experience. Try a virtual high five. So on the screen, I'm to your left and I, you're on my right so if i if i put my hand out go on really bit further, all the way over all the way over come on keep going keep going further <laughs> left keep going there. all the way other way other way there we go virtual life <laughs> so i daft explain the thought just for fun it's locked down yeah. we go crazy so this needs a mixed ready uh experience <laughs> that's what, yeah we need some we need to I'll, I'll we'll get our headsets out next time we got yeah. fun. but who knows what we'll do hey hey so <laughs> If when we switch back over here, this is what the XRTK is. Uh, so look in this architecture slide now. Mm -hmm. A long time ago, way back then, when we started to talk about how to build cross-platform frameworks, how to handle the many different headsets and different ways of things could work, and also the different systems that are involved, you know, we sat down, we worked out, and we looked at how we could make this better. Uh, Unity have done the same thing, Unreal have done the same thing, trying to find ways to build projects that could scale, not just for an in-device with AR and VR, but to all the different devices and all the different headsets and all the different ways that we can interact with mixed reality these days. So that the aim being that you can build your project once and then it will work wherever you need it to be. So yeah. at its core, we sort of built up with the foundation of this is sort of the, the mixed reality toolkit itself, this blue layer in the middle here, where we have a registry which we recognize as what's a headset, what are controllers, what is a network system, how input's going to be passed around, boundaries, networking, you name it, but in an extensible fashion so that we could plug anything into it. It didn't care. So long as it, it knew what something was and it conformed to a specific standard which is what we call a service then it would just accept it and everything could interchange to it beneath that we then built each individual system so whether it's the input system which does all the negotiation and also transmission of events around the entire framework the boundary system which will talk to the native platforms boundary systems which tell you what is the boundary space you're working in not so much in, needed for v AR, but for VR, it's obviously very important that you don't then walk into a wall that you can't see. Networking systems, so we can actually work with the different networking clients and many more. And then underneath those, we then started defining a, a standard set of what do we mean by a headset? What do we mean by a controller? And framing those in a, what we call a data provider. So a data provider is generally a platform or it's a specific set of inputs 
which are then enabled or disabled based upon what they are and where they're running. So if I start up a Windows Mixed Reality headset, a VR headset, I know I'm going to get a set of Windows Mixed Reality controllers. I'm going to get a Windows Mixed Reality headset, which has a specific camera setup, framing setup, and how that works. It's not an Oculus, it's not something else. But then if I run the same app and run it on an Oculus device, then Windows Mixed Reality doesn't start, but the Oculus provider does, which means that when you're building everything on top of this, you don't need to worry about what it runs on. The XRTK handles this for you automatically, magically, depending on what <laughs> things have been defined. <laughs> automatically, it's a word, it's a word. I, it's it's a word, word. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, from your experience, Dean, you know, obviously you're building different controller sets and how these all fit in. I mean, how would you relate to your experience in building those separate components for plugging into the architecture? Well, um, it, uh, when I started working with it, it actually took me quite a while to understand all the bits and pieces and how they work together. But uh, once it all started making sense to me, um, it was actually fairly easy to... Um, and uh, the, the, it's one thing I love about Druid is how I can easily extend it and add a, adding new data providers is just... Uh, it's super simple to do. And especially now that uh, it also has this uh, new platform system where you can easily define data providers for specific um, platforms and where they should run and where they shouldn't. Um, so it's actually pretty cool. And from my experience, I can, I don't know what to say. It's just uh, everyone has to try it, I guess. <laughs> but it, I mean, takes, uh, yeah. uh, it takes some time to actually, so I think one of the misconceptions is that um, people, many people are coming from the previous toolkits, the Holo toolkit, for example, or from VRTK, and it's just completely different. And you just have to let go of all this, uh, all the prefab thinking and mono behavior thinking, and then it gets pretty cool. I'd have to agree. I mean, for, you've got, you're obviously building actual products and projects using the XRTK. Yeah. So when you suddenly added on another device or things, I mean, what's the impact on your project when you simply like, I want to then build it for something else? So far for, for my projects, uh, I've, I've been targeting um, HoloLens, of course, so with this mixed reality and Oculus. So that's the two platforms. And luckily those two are pretty far in terms of support with the mixed reality toolkit. And so I didn't have actually the need so far to extend uh, those platforms with anything other than hands, of course. Um, but what I do is, for example, uh, I use the toolkits, um, how do you call it? Uh, addi additional systems registry, service registry. Yeah, the registered service can... providers, yeah. Yeah, so and I actually, so before I uh, migrate to XREK, um, I actually had my own service locator and then I ported it over to XREK and it's actually pretty awesome because uh, the toolkit does the heavy lifting for me and, and I have basically less boilerplate code I have to manage by myself, which is pretty cool. And then I can, I have, for example, a placement system. I don't know, networking. I have my own networking system. I have, um, some other game logic specific systems in place and I can just easily register them with the toolkit and yeah, that's really straightforward. Agreed. I mean, that's one of the big parts of this being sort of a very foundational system that is highly extensible. You can build anything and plug it into it and then it will simply work. And yeah. if you need other components and things to react to it, then you, def you define one way of building your project. So it doesn't matter what the networking system is. It doesn't matter what these game services are. They're just plug in. And in the, in the whole framework, it's, case of it's laid out nicely so that you talk to the toolkit. You don't talk to any specific networking, you certain things. So for instance, if you were having, um, for example, achievement providers, you know, you want to write one way for achievements to yeah. work in your project. So you'd simply write, a, an abstract interface for how you want achievements to work. So that's how your t game talks about achievements. Here's the collection, here's how you activate, how you deactivate and things like that. 
And then underneath, you'd write your own data provider for each of the different systems that will be lit up based upon which platform you run on, whether it's Steam, whether it's Xbox Live, whether it's PlayStation, even if you really, if PlayStation VR is a thing that you want to do. But <laughs> you don't then change your game to work in these things. And in, especially in game development, we've done a lot of this and we have to keep rewriting these things for each new project. But the framework provides a way to do this for you. And I think as we move into the 0.3 days, when we start to build up our whole UX library, which I think we'll talk about in the future thing, where the UX design for XRTK is not going to be what you would think is a traditional XRTK, because unlike the MRTK, we're not building discrete components that are bound to the toolkits and how they're going to work. We're going to design UX, and then we're going to find plugins to connect that UX into the XRTK so that it's a lot easier to use and a lot more transportable from system to system. Yeah, that's right. So um, it's it's a very good point, actually. So um, the the ability to uh, write code once and what the great thing about the data provider architecture is that uh, even if you need to um, have some platform specific code run in your custom systems or game logic, then it's just super straightforward to register. For example, I don't know, let's say placement. Placement is something that's kind of different depending on the platform. So with HoloLens, uh, you will have a placement based on the spatial mesh and so on and so forth. In VR, you might be using a different type of placing your game elements in in the world. And so you have a, you can define a placement system and make it work on all platforms and then the pieces that are platform specific you just write a data provider for it and then it just pl plugs into the system and it just works basically yeah so. i mean that's something we'll go get. i think we'll use do that in a following system because the, the actual the actual platforming system which was built fairly recently um give us a great way to set a boundary to turn things on so you don't need hash shifts and statements here, there, and there of turn this on, turn that. You simply say, well, I have a component. It only runs when the Oculus is recognized. Yeah. It will only activate when Oculus recognizes. And if it doesn't, then it won't. And it's that, it's that simple. It's, it simplifies the code and the, re, like I said, the reusability. And you write something that will just work. And it will literally just work. You exactly. build and design uh, your design time, how you want things to work. And then in runtime, you say, right, well, this is what should activate rather than exactly. lots of complicated code. Um, that's certainly something we need to go into a future session going on about. I mean, getting access and finding out about the XRTK is easy. Uh, all we simply got to do is pop over to XRTK.io. Um, and everything's there. And from there, you can go straight into the GitHub and look at all the source code. It can view articles and things we've got written around. but as it stands, I mean, this is an exciting time because, I mean, yeah, the hand stuff you're doing, do you know, and how easy it is to translate to the different platforms. And obviously, we've got uh, HoloLens 2 working there. We've got Oculus Hands working. Uh, we may or may not get a Magic Leap Hands working. depends mm -hmm. what happens with Magic Leap. Um, and I think right off the back of that, uh, we've got the, the Ultra Leap, I think you're working on. And yeah. I think I've also got the EET. EETE hands implementation would be interesting. We have to talk about that, that working. And from what I can see is uh, I'm also working on sort of the, the, steep, the new and improved Steam implementation since Unity ripped mm -hmm. it out of it, the project. But we've been working with Val to see what's there. And in there, there's some interesting hands things coming on, which is interesting in the API. So we'll have to think about Steam hands at some point in the near Absolutely. future. Yeah, well, I mean, with hands, it's uh, as you said, we uh, we are already covering. Uh, I mean, I guess everyone will agree right now. I mean, Oculus Quest is like the hardest device oh, yeah. when when it comes to uh, hand tracking. So our we are Oculus Quest is working pretty pretty well so far. And in the editor, I mean that that took us by surprise when we yeah, just, it we enabled makes... it for the editor platform and it just worked. Yeah, it just works and it's ultimately just 
press play in Unity and you can actually work with your hands, which is pretty awesome considering that, um, I mean, since they introduced Oculus Link, that's it's just awesome because previously you would actually have to build and deploy to device to test every bit of your experience. And now you can just use Unity Editor because in the end, I mean, besides uh, the looks, the graphics quality and whatever, your uh, the standalone Oculus um, experience will be the same on the Quest uh, mostly. So you can, it's it's a pretty good way to test your Quest applications, even if it's of course not running on the device. Well, um, beyond that, because if you want to test your hands implementation for whichever platform, you yeah. can use the Quest just for testing. Uh, so exactly. the whole and then you know that if once your interactions are working both near and far, once you build it for another platform, it will just work because it's the same yeah. hands implementation because you're building on the XRTK, not for a platform. Yeah, exactly. So it's I mean, all good. Uh, the, one of the issues with hands is that uh, basically uh, there is a, it's um, the industry is kind of lacking a standard for how optical hand tracking um I mean, every almost every platform has its own set of joints they are providing, and that makes it really hard. And that's what I'm trying to solve with XRDK, and it's working pretty good. So we have Oculus and Windows Mixed Reality, and we also have actually Magic Leap running. But uh, Magic Leap is one of those platforms where you get very few joints. So and for for our pose recognizer, so we actually have an XRDK we you can record your custom pose, like, I don't oh, know, yeah, whatever was... it is. And, awesome. and then it gets recognized and it triggers, for example, an input action. But if you don't have the joints, it will not work because obviously we need the joints so we can yeah, yeah. recognize the poses. And that's uh, something that's really hard to solve. Uh, just yesterday, or was it today? I'm not sure. Um, I've read that they have some... Um, there is some new standards coming. I think it was in OpenXR where uh, where they managed to have Oculus and some other platforms, basically cross-platform cross hands implementations. And so I will have to check that out and see uh, whether we can use it for the XRDK as well. Um, yeah. I mean, this is one other topic is also it's it's sometimes really hard to keep up, obviously. So you start working on something, and once you're close to finishing it, you, there's already something new, some new Unity feature, some new uh, uh, whatever APIs you can use, and then you start over again, basically. Except with the beauty of the XRTK is that if the platform changes underneath, we just change the platform. You don't change the exactly. Product, so. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> Be to it. <laughs> and that, another great thing, as you said, is that it makes it really, even, I mean, I've my project started out back in Unity, I don't know, 2018 something, I, I don't remember. And now I'm on the latest Unity, which is 2021. But by using XREK, I actually don't have to worry too much about breaking changes and whatever. And even if there is something, some new APIs or changes, I just have to change one data provider mostly, and then um, everything else will just keep going because it's plain C sharp code. It's there is no um, dependencies on anything else basically, and that helps a lot in this industry where things are changing on a daily basis, basis almost. Yeah, uh, it's good to have that. I mean, because XRTK is using like the UPM standard. If you yeah. need to switch versions, it's it's easy. Exactly. So you move forward and back, and it's just exactly. Like, I, I would love that the fact that gone are the days where you have to import the asset into your project, and then hope to God that when you updated it, it remembered the fact that some files are less than missing, but they didn't. You'd have to delete it and go back. But with UPM, it's it's just um, just quickly switch in and out. Yeah. Um, I've actually pulled up the article on the, the OpenXR certifying hands and hand app com compliance. It's a mouthful. But yeah, <laughs> it's good to see they're doing the standards. I mean, OpenXR will be to XRTK just another platform exactly, if, yeah. when we add it. So 
XRTK will support OpenXR, which sounds odd, a cross-platform framework supporting a cross-platform standard on top of cross-platform capable things. But ultimately, what it means is that if you then wanted to build something for OpenXR, it would just work because you built them on the XRTK and the XRTK supports OpenXR. Same as our other discussions that have been going on this week, but I'm not going to talk too much about WebXR. I mean, that's, yeah. things are going in that, in that space are exciting. And on our Discord, the conversation continues. Mm. Um, it's pretty exciting, right? So I am I have to admit, I'm pretty... Uh, I haven't checked out WebXR a lot yet. So I'm just following all the news and uh, what people are uh, creating. And it's quite impressive. I So um, historically, I was always kind of... Um, I'm not much of a web developer. I always hated um, web I, apps. I, still do. I, I always preferred native over web. Um, but I have to admit that it's catching up. And I mean, it's it's crazy. And uh, pretty exciting thinking that at some point you will be able to just have some uh, URL, some website where you can, that you can enter it on your VR browser, XR yeah. browser, and then it just launches a mixed reality experience. Yeah. Well, That's we, uh, pretty we, awesome. Yeah. We hope it's going to be that easy, but uh, I mean, a, it's an emerging standard. Yeah. 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 At some point, maybe it's a timeline of five years, maybe it's 10 years, but at some point it will, I don't know. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, some have asked, you know, would WebXR make things like the XRTK redundant? And the answer is no, because yeah. web is web and native apps and native apps. And there's always going to be big cases for one or the other. And yeah. having a solution that you can simply say, well, we ship and we do it to all these platforms, whether or not you're on these, and having solutions that run in the web to a certain degree and then have a light up moment where they can then switch to native or launch the native app and the, or vice versa. Or even, yeah. I think one I think more exciting things, especially at WebXR, the web kind of streaming support is, having a web XR component running in your native app, mm-hmm. having a window yeah. within a window. To, mm. Yeah. But um, it's, it's very early logic. days. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's so much that still needs to happen for web XR to become mainstream. You know, we need proper web assembly support for the, for the yeah. things. We need better standards around um, web RTC and things like that for how very video streaming things and things work. So early days were very exciting, but again, XRTK will support WebXR as, well, hopefully, because the community is really help digging in there and helping us out in yeah. having it as another platform you simply build to. Yeah, um, exactly. And I don't think uh, I don't think there's a need to choose or for, there's uh, no need to decide whether one of them will survive or not or is needed or not needed. I mean, if we look at, uh, at web, uh, there is tons of frameworks I mean, it didn't stop anywhere. So people didn't create, uh, I don't know, let's say Angular, and then just yeah. stop creating front-end frameworks. There's oh, always no. new yeah. new frameworks popping up, new yeah. JavaScript libraries, new it's whatever. React, Rust, you <laughs> name it. it yeah. So um, but- XRK will always have its place. And if, we, uh, if it supports WebXR at some point, uh, fully supports it, I mean, it's a win-win situation because you get both the best of both worlds in that case. Yep, it's true. I, mm-hmm. I mean, in some ways, if we start to truly succeed, we need a new web. Okay. The current web can't support WebXR, really. Yeah. It's not, it isn't built for that. But again, no. many bright people are working on those things. Um, I think even some of our partners are working very heavily with a lot of the open standard partners uh, on these things. So yeah. It's always exciting times ahead. So I think we've gone on there. We're doing good for our first episode. So follow on, like, and subscribe if you're <laughs> liking what you see. Um, and as to the future, I mean, we're hoping to do these as regularly so we can <laughs> spare the yeah. time. You know, we're building these things. We're testing these things. Some of us have got day jobs. Actually, all of us got yeah. day jobs. But... <laughs> oh, we're trying to do so much in the yeah. world and yeah. one... One locked in day at a time. But at least it's good. good. So, okay. So, I've been Sam in Darkside Jackson. You can find me at Sam in Darkside J. And here's all the links to all the different things. And also, you can join us on Discord. 
Dino, do you want to sign yourself out? Where can people find you? Uh, these days on Discord, obviously, in the XRK Discord, and on Twitter, uh, at... I, I'm not going to even just try to find It's on name. screen. It's on screen. Yeah. People, <laughs> in fact, that, that's the thing. How do we pronounce your surname? Because I must admit, I actually yeah. don't know. It's Fazekic. Okay, Fazekic. Okay. I'm not going to. I'm not. I'm not going to attempt to butcher that. That would be just. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Uh... <laughs> Moving on to yeah. many more. So uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll set up a schedule of what we're going to talk about. We'll hopefully talk about different topics and different things like we've done here. Uh, all things XRTK, and I don't know. We may even get to try and get some guests on board. We got. We got people we can talk call. Yeah. We. Who are you going to call? <laughs> I watched that recently. It's great. So uh, I'm signing up. I'm Sun, and this is Dina, and we are out of here. Yeah.